so the the I've been interested in networks for ages, and I've, one of the things that sort of often draws people into networks immediately are these are these visualizations. And there's, you know, on the one hand, they're kind of like just sparkly little like things on the side that sort of make us think, ooh, it's that pretty. On the other hand, one of the problems with understanding networks are that there are these high high dimensional features. There's very high. There's lots of information in them, and any good index is only going to capture a little part of that. So one dimension, such as centralization or the degree or something like that. Whereas the picture gives you sort of a gestalt of it. It gives you sort of a, a better overview of what's there, if it works. And so the key is to find a, a, a strategy to visualize these networks that provides information without providing a lot of, um, uh, of bias at the same time. And so I want to go through a few things that have to do with networks um, uh, and visualizations. Um, I want to give a little history, let you see what's the, sort of been done in the past, um, talk about like why we might do this at all, and then go through most of the times when we spent on um, what are these kind of strategies that we can use to make a, a, a visualization more or less effective. So the very first network study started with Wheeler's work about this great this classic mathematical problem known as the Bridges of Cronenberg problem, and the the thought is. There's this, there's a, it's a city of bridges, and then there are these islands. There's this island in the middle of the river. Excuse me. <coughs> and it's a nice little puzzle. Could you imagine walking over one bridge and over an X and cross every bridge only once and never twice? Right. This is the the, the, the the way the problem is set up. And if you are, can imagine thinking about this just theoretically, if you just have bridges on a straight line, this is not a problem, right? You go up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, and there you have it, right? Um, but if you have a network that looks like this, or, or a, a, a geography that looks like this, it's not entirely clear that you can cross one, cross the other, cross this one, cross that one, and not have to cross them all at the same time, right? And so um, what Wheeler um, did is he turned this into a graph. And this is the very this is the start of graph theory in mathematics. This is where it first um, uh, showed its head, and it also raises this idea of abstracting from something that's real, like a point of a land or a bridge, um, and turning that into um, this notion of points and lines. And so the idea of points and lines or vertices and edges um, had its start a long, long time ago, and um, uh, this is where you know where we sort of get our work. Um, Network visualizations um, had their start probably in kinship diagrams, and this is where people saw them um, most likely, or, or, or were most originally familiar with them. And so, from classic cultural anthropology, um, where you have the extent of descent from great 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 grandfather and so forth, um, down to cousins and uncles and so forth, um, or bureaucracies. And so, this is um, an organizational chart um, uh, for a, a bureaucracy in Russia um, uh, in the early 20s. Um, it looks a little like Duke today, um, but uh, uh, actually, the, 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 I've asked the administrators every year since I've been here for a copy of the organizational chart, and they won't give me one. Um, uh, uh, I'm afraid that they really don't want the answer. Um, but for social network research, the, the original visualizations that really sparked everyone's interest were coming from Jacob Moreno. And what Jacob did is he focused on um, this idea of making the invisible visible, and so he, he had multi-relational color diagrams in his work in 1934. And um, he had a, a very um, a rigid system for how he would draw his network. So gender was encoded in, um, uh, females were in circles, males were in triangles. The, um, uh, if it was a negative tie, it was in black. If it was a positive tie, it was in red. We might do the opposite now, just oh, it's kind of an interesting difference in that. Um, if the tie is reciprocated, he put a little cross line in it like this. And so in this case, there's a, um, a negative tie from MF to AC, but a positive tie from AC to MF. So they disagree on whether they are getting along, right? Um, and in this network, you can just look at it, and you can tell that CM over here is not liked by anybody, right? So of all the girls in this little cabin, um, uh, these were uh, runaway um, uh, uh, kids um, uh, in, in, in New York, the, um, everyone in the cabin seems to dislike CM, and even the people she's close friends with are friends with an enemy, right? And so if you want to figure out why CM might not be thriving in this environment, you might want to start here, right? This is at least a place to keep in mind. Um, and this is the, the image I showed you the very first day, right? He exploded this idea. Each one of these little um, uh, pieces is actually a cabin um, uh, on this entire campus, and this entire graph is one giant colored 
um, piece. And the thought was you could look at it and sort of draw some inferences. And when your networks are small, right, and you can actually just look at them all, you can actually see, well, this is the kind of person that we might want to focus on, see what's going on there, figure out who's most the, who's the likes most popular, who's the dislike most popular, what kind of people are um, uh, have high reciprocity and what forth. You can just look at it. It's just easy enough to expand by looking in your eyeballs. As they get larger, it's a little harder. Over the years, um, uh, these ideas were taken up by a lot of folks, particularly in um, community studies. And so in community studies and agriculture, this is a beautiful um, uh, series of, of books by uh, Lundberg and Steele. And um, these are each, each circle in these cases are a household, and they're um, sized by the um, uh, SES of that household, so whether this was a rich household or a poor household. And so this was the richest household in the, uh, in the village, and everyone liked this person, right? So everyone who ported they're going to. What's amazing about this diagram, again, these were all done by hand in the 30s, um, is that if you actually go from page to page, they're very rigorous about the number of lines that go out of one page and come back into another, right? So in theory, a person could go through and reconstruct this entire edge list by going over to the maps that cross over to the other side. Um, and so the amount of detail that people put into thinking about these very carefully, all again done by hand without any software to help them, um, was pretty remarkable. Um, there's a tendency, once you have these relationships, you think, ah, oh, no, I have a map, I want to add a layer to it. And this is, the, this is probably a, a basic theme of network visualization over, over the years, which is that we keep adding different amounts of information on top of the edges. And so in this case, again, we have households um, are the unit of analysis, but we have the proportion of which you visit one person who's either from your um, a neighborhood or from a different neighborhood as a pie chart on top of the nodes. The size is based on the number of, of nodes you receive, and then this, this layering of, of some attribute, a color or a distribution or something like that on top. Um, remarkably, adding pie charts to uh, uh, a network has, is still really not an easy thing to do. Um, there's only a handful of people who've written their own software to do it. It should be a, a, a trivial, but um, it's, not hard, it's not done that often. Up until this point, up until the 50s, um, uh, this is um, Nothaway's, what he calls a target sociogram. Up until this point, most of these kinds of layouts were really just done um, uh, artistically. People um, would try to put things in a way that might minimize edge crossings or otherwise have a way to sort of make some sense where it's all laid out flat. But there's no guiding theoretical principle to figure out why one node would be in one place versus another place. It's just wherever the artist decides to stick it down on, on the page and where how much patience they had for redrafting these and drawing them by hand. And what Nothaway came up with was this idea of a target. And they thought was that there's people in the middle who are really important, and so we're going to put them at the center of the target, and people who are peripheral to the set, we'll put them on the edge. And so we come up with some measure of center to edge, which then we ultimately end up on centrality. Right? And in his case, he slipped it up between, or he split up the vertical side from females on one side and males on the other. Now, circles and squares are kind of boring, so you could imagine making them boys with bow ties or with well bows in their hair, right? And, and at this point, you actually had an algorithm um, uh, that lets you figure out the layout, um, which were peg, was a pegboard with rubber bands, right? So this was literally um, uh, the way you could do it, and you'd get a draft of it by moving um, this around. Rumor has it, I haven't seen it, but rumor has it that there's a 3D version of this where they took um, a series of a bunch of abacus, I don't know what an abacus, right? Take a, I don't know what their collection of abacus would be. But uh, abacai, right? So I think a bunch of them. Um, uh, and then you can run um, uh, edges in all three dimensions. Um, seems like a lot of work to me. Um, but uh, you can still do target sociograms. This is uh, using uh, uh, PayEC. There's a, there's a circular layout where you can restrict nodes to being on each of these points and move them around by hand if that's what um, floats your boat. Um, the idea of having a dimensionality to the network, right, that there's some meaning from edge to the center, uh, people then immediately took that idea and started adding dimensionality to the axes and the kinds of graphs we're used to looking at. And so in this case, there's an SES um, uh, 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 app meaning to the vertical axis, and then the groups are aligned according to the x-axis in a way that tries to make sense of it. This fails miserably. Right? This is just not a particularly good use. And what happens is I think people start going down the wrong path historically. They start moving down trying to layer more information or fix meaning of edges as opposed to thinking carefully about um, what sort of networks might be good in themselves to do. Um, so one solution is if it doesn't work in two dimensions, let's use polar dimensions. Those tend not to work particularly well. Um, uh, let's embed it on a hypercube if you get a really, really big network. That's also hard to see. This turns up, this is an internet. This is a map of um, computers connected to each other um, uh, uh, on the internet. Um, uh, so we can see that. Um, 
Over time, of course, it moves from these scientific strategies to what I would say is a little bit more silly strategies. So these become uh, some popular um, uh, for marketers. Um, this is a, a, an advertisement about how it's trying to sell hand cream, and the idea is you start with one person, she tells her friends, and so forth. You see some little funny things like that. Not sure it's all that, it's scientifically all that interesting, but maybe it sells some ideas. Um, journalists then pick it up and start doing things that are even worse layouts. Um, uh, here you're trying to layer on um, uh, uh, different, uh, this is a, uh, uh, a New York Times thing about people, where they went to, business people, where they went to law school, and who they worked with at various and sundry times. Um, you could imagine looking at scandals, right? So the New York Times does this all the time. They're, they're sort of the, 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 the leaders of the infographics. Um, this is my world's favorite, um, my worst um, my network diagram, um, in part because it's so damn important at the same time of being so bad. Um, what you have here are, this is a, a real model of what they thought was going on in Iraq um, uh, at the time. Right? And if you want to take it to say that what this really means is that it's a complicated mess there, then yes, it's a complicated mess. Um, but if you really thought you could learn anything from this, um, it's kind of remarkable. Um, Sometimes people just make jokes out of them, right? So this is a spoof of the Christakis and Fowler papers um, uh, that your networks make you fat. Um, uh, and I, feel, I actually think this is a remarkable image because someone, th these are real points and lines connected here. So I, I have no idea how someone actually got this to work, um, but it's, it's pretty remarkable. Um, Unless we think, of course, that only um, uh, journalists um, uh, uh, make bad network diagrams, this is a published diagram uh, in a network. And I think that if you think you can learn anything from this um, uh, showing up um, uh, on a printed page somewhere, you, you're really you're fooling yourself. And so the question is, well, how do we get from something like this to something that's scientifically useful and hopefully aesthetically pleasing at the same time? And um, I think that we have to sort of try to walk through the boundaries between science, art, and craft um, uh, to make this happen. And so, if the goal from Moreto's is to make these powerful, invisible structures um, uh, visible, how do we do it in a way that we can actually see it? And um, the, 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 in, the intuition that Moreno gave us was that network science could be something like a telescope, right? We could sort of look out at, this, at the world and see it in the same way that we might see uh, uh, planets moving around um, uh, uh, another place. But, um, of course, the problem is, if you're not really careful what you're looking at, right, our eyes can be deceiving. And so we really want to have some way to draw these diagrams where we're seeing what we're communicating, what we want to be communicating um, as we're working. And so, what distinguishes a scientifically effective visualization? Uh, there's a couple of dimensions I'm going to move through here. First is a basic visualization craft, sort of a style or rhetoric. This is what's coming out of Tufti, out of um, uh, some of the visualization textbooks. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about these features because these are general to all types of, of data visualization. We'll touch on them a little bit, but by and large, things like clarity, scaling, coloring, layering information, these kinds of things, um, these are uh, uh, common across any kind of scientific visualization, and I want to focus on the things that are, are unique to network visualization, but these are going to pop up, and the distinction between you know, a good coloring and a bad coloring can mean the world of difference um, uh, when you're sort of trying to make sense of something, but we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about it. Um, the, that distinction between craft and not, um, I, I think, ultimately has to do with revision and care in trying to really craft a visualization. So this is the, these are two images of the exact same network. On the left, on your left, is what comes out by default without anything else from a screenshot from Payak, right? And as that comes out, there's not much to it. You can't see much distinction. We take the exact same network do a little movement around on the edges, color by centrality, size by um, a degree, put its nice scale on it, change the size of the nodes and, this, and the density of the lines and the thicknesses and so forth, and it's just a lot easier to look at. Right? And I want to talk about how you get from this to that. That's really the, the goal today. Questions, comments, thoughts thus far? <clears throat> All right. So. Um, uh, the key element, I think, that um, networks um, provide for us, at least in one sense, is a way to represent social space. So if we want to represent social space, the question is, which social space do we want to represent? Um, the, the idea here is that it might be a social space, but it's probably not a, a perfectly accurate social space. Right? The, the problem with networks, one problem with networks, as a, as a space, the space analogy with networks, is that most spatial things we can see are two dimensions, maybe three dimensions, but networks can be n minus one dimensions, right? So there's, there's a huge number of amount of dimensionality in these networks, so we are forced to distort them in some way. 
And so the question is, can we distort them so we can see it in a way that doesn't um, fundamentally change um, the story we want to tell? Um, and so you can see here, um, uh, this is a two-dimensional representation of a network. This is a three-dimensional representation of the network. It turns out that three dimensions are really, 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 really hard to see on print. If you can't move it around or play with it, what you get is occlusion. You get nodes that are stuck behind other nodes. And so a three-dimensional representation, we all sort of think, well, that instead of distorting it, I'll just add a third dimension. And it does create better fit. It makes it so that you essentially don't have to distort it as much, but it's often much, much harder to actually look at. Hey, Jim. Yeah. A while back, don't, don't flip back, but you showed a picture of a, um, or a, a visualization of, that's very common. It looks like fiber optics around some kind of Christmas bowl. Mm -hmm. so it, the goal there does seem to be three dimensions. You see these everywhere, right? Yeah. And you quickly toss to the side. Except you do see them everywhere, mm -hmm. and I and I, I've been wondering now, and I guess previously, why that is. Is it is it that they're trying to capture three dimensions? Yeah. So in that case, it's, it's even falls it's, flat because of the coloring. Yeah. It's uh, so what. what there, you're going to see two versions of that. The, yeah. the image I showed before was actually even worse than you might think. It's, it's not only the three dimensions, but it's three dimensions, dimensions on what's known as a hypersphere. And so if you can imagine a fish eye, a fish eye lens in three dimensions, it's squishing things off to the side. And with that, when we, with the software she designed is to um, actually allow you to go in and manipulate it. So you can twist things around and move. But if you just try to present it as an image to look at, it's exceedingly difficult to make sense of. And that's why everything was yeah. Right. Yeah, there's right. Yeah, right. Exactly. Right. And that's exactly what's going on there. All right. Um, I don't know what time to talk about that. Let's get that idea. So I think that. So what distinguishes a scientifically effective di um, uh, visualization? I think we have to think about the different kinds of um, network-specific graphic problems. And it's ultimately going to be the case that once you have a, um, a, a, a network problem you're trying to explain, a, a visualization will, will become um, relevant to, to you um, that might be good for describing, say, edge-level features that won't be good for describing dynamics. And so because networks have so many dimensions to them, you often have to pick what it is you're trying to, um, uh, trying to show. And it turns out that this creates a tension between these three pieces. Right? So on the one hand, um, as scientists, we're fundamentally interested in data fidelity. We don't want to lie with our pictures. On the other hand, we want to answer a real question uh, in a way that um, uh, has a, a pleasing visual strategy. And these things don't always line up quite nicely. So we have to think about um, uh, how we might do that. All right. So what are the elements um, uh, of, uh, uh, of a good visualization? I think for a good scientific visualization, it has to build some intuition about the social process that's generating the network. So you want to have some idea about um, uh, the, the network should tell you a story that's obvious for what's going on in the setting. The example Jeff gave a moment ago that showed us that um, uh, the network was highly clustered by grade, we can tell a nice story about that. It makes sense. The kids spend a lot of time in the same grade as their peers, and so the clustering by grade is, is intuitive when we see it colored up there. You need to, I think, a good visualization succinctly captures the high dimensional properties of a network. Right? If our goal were just to figure out um, uh, who has higher degree or lower degree, I'll just count the number of edges. I don't need a visualization for that. I have a really good single dimensional measure. What networks provide us is a multi dimensional measure simultaneously, or images, excuse me, is a, is a multi dimensional representation that should complement the, the single dimensional measures we're going to, the metrics we're going to calculate directly. Um, it should be worth the space, right? So a picture really should be worth a thousand words. If it takes me more words to describe what's going on in the picture than it does for you to see it, then it's not worth the effort. If it's a giant hairball that just looks like a hairball, then it's not worth the effort, right? If you can't learn anything from it, then, then don't waste the space. And finally, I do think that they should be, they should be pretty. Right? There should be something about them that you go, yeah, that's nice, right? Um, it shouldn't be jarring. The color shouldn't be um, the kind of thing that hurt us. Um, <laughs> on the science side, some, some science can hurt. I mean, color can hurt. Um, uh, as much as I love Payek, like they have no color sense at all, right? Um, so anyway, the, uh, the, uh, uh, from the those are what I would consider sort of aesthetic features to some degree, or communication features. As scientists, we have a we have another layer, right, uh, that we want to think about, and that is that we often want to be able to replicate our results, right? So if it's not good if I do a visualization and you do a visualization the next day and they're radically different, then somehow that somehow seems wrong, right? We, as a scientist, we'd like to be able to have our work be consistent and and, and replicatable. There's a quantification feature. We'd like to know whether or not these these images fit, right? We'd like a goodness of fit of some sort to see is this a good measure or a bad measure, and again, there should be some theoretical relevance. 
to why this is it, to what we're describing. I like to use an example um, uh, for why we visualize networks um, uh, that uh, comes from uh, Tufti and it's been around for a long time. Um, it has to do with scatter plots, and some of you may have seen this. But imagine that you have these three series, um, uh, and you do a bivariate regression between x and y. If you take these three series and do a bivariate uh, regression of x to y, you're going to get the exact same summary statistic up until um, uh, things even like the sum of squares across all three of these pieces. All right, so from a quantified, from a ba basic regression standpoint, y1, y2, and y3 are exactly the same. Right? But if you look at them in a scatter plot, this is y1. This is y2, this is y3, right? We see something fundamentally different across these three that are missed in the statistical summary. And this is what the power of visualization is. It lets us see something about the whole, right, as opposed to a single collection of the individual pieces. Right? And so what I would like to do is figure out, is there a, an analog to this for a sociogram? So if we want to think about a network, can we move from a series of statistics that have to they say our, our urban coefficients, um, can we complement those with something like a visualization or scatter plot that would make um, uh, more sense of the underlying coefficients we're seeing. Well, if you want to do that, you can ask yourself what makes a, um, uh, a scatter plot work, right? A scatter plot's pretty easy. Each point represents a pair of numbers. So this is four and three, this is seven and eight. But this picture is the exact same data, right? So this is a perfect representation of the data table, right? Um, I've just randomly sorted the x-axis. Right? Now, don't know why I would do it, right? That seems like a silly thing to do, right? Um, uh, but if I want to recover the data from this image, right, I can come here and say I got 4 to 3, I got 6 to 6, right? This is a perfect representation of the data, but somehow this is more informative. And the reason it's more informative is if we understand the ordinality of the axis, right? We've been trained. We have a convention. And that convention is that you don't randomly sort axes on a scatter plot, right? You run them from low to high. Right? And if you didn't do that, it doesn't make any sense. And you realize that what that allows you to do intuitively is you're not just looking at the nine points that are on this plot. You're looking at the nine squared relationships among all of those points. Right? I'm comparing this piece to that piece and realizing that they're distant in this dimension and distant in that dimension. And so I get all of these distances simultaneously. And well, you don't get that if you just get some sort of a random arrangement of the pieces. And so what that's telling us is that there's an underlying space, and that space is meaningful. And we want to do the same thing with networks. We want to think about the kind of space that's underlying the, the graph so that we can um, uh, draw it nicely. Unfortunately, the current state of affairs in network visualizations is far from that. These are three representations of the exact same data that have showed up in print. Um, uh, this is the, the, the um, uh, Zachary Karate Club that um, Peter Mooka showed us yesterday. Um, you have the image, I think this is the actual image that um, Peter showed us um, yesterday, but you've seen it in lots of different formats. Again, this is no different than taking a scatter plot and randomly sorting the edges. Right? What we'd like to be able to do is have the same thing every time. The other sort of insight we can gain from scatter plots is it's really easy to layer on lots of different information and make it possible for people to get more from the um, scatter plot than just the association between X and Y. And this is a, a, an example that's coming out of Gapminder. If you haven't ever gone and played with Gapminder, it's a wonderful exploratory analysis tool because you can color things by country. This is a country level data set. You can color them by the, lots of different variables simultaneously to layer on multiple dimensions. So you get the primary dimensions between X and Y. You get a third dimension in color, a fourth dimension in size. You can get a fifth dimension in movement over time as you move the Gapminder through. It's a very nice way of thinking about layers and layers and layers of multiple information on the same um, uh, figure. So the problem summary then is that the benefit to network graphics is that it's supposed to make network visible, make the visible, make visible the invisible, right? We want to get a sense of reality to unobserved features. We want to make um, uh, them pretty and then communicate. It also provides a multidimensional insight to get to, to some crossing, and it helps us think by organizing, arranging, or abstracting um, uh, features that are um, uh, really important, um, uh, at least the part that we want to communicate. The challenges are that there's no consistent or obvious display frame. There's usually too much information, so we have to throw some things away. We have to deny the data in Eric Leifert's old terms, and we have to find some kind of a scale. It turns out that it's a lot easier to um, uh, display small networks than it is um, uh, large networks, and it might be the case on large networks that we want to do something different than we've done on the, on the other side. Most of us are also a little bit impatient, right? So if you can imagine a perfect layout. If it, took, if it takes a month to run, we're not going to do it, right? It should be um, uh, some set on that part. 
And so each of these kinds of problems then um, uh, uh, have given rise to a set of heuristics that computer programmers have built into network visualization software to try to highlight one element or another. So for example, we might want to have con consistent edge lengths, that if I'm one, length, one step from you, I should be one length from you. That's what a step should equal a length. So that might be, I might have an, a layout algorithm that really prioritizes um, a consistent edge lengths, but that's going to lead to lots of line crossings. So another thing that makes an image nice so I can trace paths around are to avoid line crossing. And all of these things play on simultaneously. And what this means is as a programmer, if I sort of favor one of these or the other, I'll get a different kind of a layout. And this is why the computer programs that we give can give us radically different images for each one of, for the same data. So, so this is from a program called YED, Y-E-D, and there are a dozen different default um, layout programs in that, um, uh, in that software. And each of these, um, uh, in some sense, uh, uh, tell the same story, and, uh, uh, but because it's the same data, but again, it, depending on the underlying um, uh, rule that's guiding it, you wouldn't be able to tell that this network is necessarily the same, say, as this one. All right, so that's set up the problem a lot. Now I want to um, spend a little more time talking about the other pieces. So I think there are essentially two basic types of, of broad categories of, net, of, of, of network layouts. The first is some layout where there's a, a realistic dimensionality to the y-axis. The other is that there's not, where the fundamental issue is a spatial distribution more like a map as opposed to like a, a data infographic. When you have a, a meaningful y-axis like hierarchy, then you would like to be able to highlight that because readers can see that there's a flow from one tie side to the other. And so if there is some dominant organizing feature in your network that can order nodes from a source to a destination, then it makes a lot of sense to put that into the graph. And this is what Giovanna showed us a minute ago when we looked at these trees of um, RDS seeds. So we start with one node, they recruit somebody else, they recruit somewhere else. It's a natural hierarchical structure. It makes sense to display that as a hierarchy from top to bottom. The space-based layouts, the way they work, is that they try to focus on proximity. And they, they're working on this notion that social space could be represented as a two-dimensional um, uh, physical space. And to do that, you imagine that people that are close to each other are going to be within the same radius of each other. So there's a one-link radius around each of these three points. And that radius, if it remains the same everywhere, creates a consistent distance um, uh, between points. The problem is, from this graph, I can tell that two points are near each other, but I have a really hard time figuring out where the root of the hierarchy is. Right? So if your network has a strong hierarchy, this won't show it. On the other hand, if your network doesn't have any kind of hierarchy built into it, forcing one on it is a really bad idea. Right? So in this case, the, um, uh, the algorithm is going to do its best to take nodes that have more outgoing ties and ingoing ties and put it at the top, but it's never going to fit well and it's going to look like a jumbled mess. On the other hand, because the, um, the pressure towards consistent edge link are pushing nodes next to each other, what you end up seeing here are clusters of nodes that are friends with each other will be drawn to a similar region of the space, where those that are not connected to each other will be pushed further out in the space. The cost that comes from this is there is no up, down, right, left, interact, right? It's just proximity. This image fits exactly the same if I rotate it, if I twist it, if I flip it upside down. So within those kinds of spatial um, uh, transformations, this network will be consistent, but I could easily run the model again and flip it over and get a different result. Right. It wouldn't be different in terms of proximity, but it would look different than its first reaction. Uh -huh. The final sort of port direction of, uh, there's another sort of version of, of thinking about networks, um, uh, which is to think about a fixed coordinate layout. In this case, you have some other information that you're fixing the coordinates to that is not a network base. And the classic example, these are, um, uh, are something like ge geography. So if I have, in this case, each node is a hospital. And so our hospitals actually have a real, like on the earth, latitude and longitude. So I can place that on the map and I know where they are. Um, and this is what the network model that looks like, a space-based model that looks like. Now, I think depending on your problem, right, well, this might be a better visualization than that. Right. It turns out from a social space standpoint, this model fits better than this model. I'm going to explain what this fits statistic is here in a second. Um, but this, the advantage of this is that readers know what the map of the United States looks like. Right. The problem is I have no way to figure out what's going on up here in this little purple cluster because it's just too many people around Boston, whereas you know, the Midwest and the West takes up the entire size of the space, even though there aren't that many hospitals out there. Right. So the, the, this, the, 
Physical geographic maps fundamentally conflate population density with spatial arrangement. If that's okay, if that helps you communicate your piece, that's fine. Um, and if my story is about how fast a disease can move from Texas to Seattle, then it's nice to have this moved up because I want my policy people to realize that they're at risk from things going on in Texas, which is really hard to explain over here. If instead I want to figure out essentially the differences between clustering from one set or the other, then I might, um, I might prefer this kind of a layout. Right, so the fifth statistic that I'm fitting here on the, on the bottom is literally the correlation between the geodesic distance in the network and the Euclidean distance on screen. And so if I have managed to do this trick perfectly, right, where I have the distance on screen is equal to the distance on my, in geodesic space, that correlation would be perfect. Right? Um, and what I'm getting over here is the extent to which it's a, it's a poor fit, the distance from one is really the number of nodes that I had to squish down I'm on top of each other because there's too many dimensions. So it turns out that a geographic representation of the nodes, right, is not quite as good a fit from a, from a representation of the underlying social space as a four-space layout is, as this sort of edge-constrained distance sort of layout is. Um, but it might communicate something different. John? So I'm assuming pi f gives me this as a nice little... It does now, yes. That's cool. I talked Andre into adding it to the list, so it's there now. Um, uh, the fact that I've been using this program for longer than I care to remember, um, Andre answers my emails. So um, uh, uh, it usually puts in what I suggest. Um, so um, uh, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not. Now there's another kind of fixed layout, which is actually um, uh, something like a circular layout. And usually I find a, a, a simple circular layout where you take the entire network and put it in one big circle pretty useless. Right? It doesn't help us much. On the other hand, you can oftentimes um, do something that's a combination of these two, where I might take a network like this, right, where I have each of these nodes, and this is, I think, in fact, is the same network of these, uh, uh, these, these two graphs. And now I've laid it out in space, but there's a lot of mess here that I can't see, and I don't have a really sense of how many ties are in here because the nodes are on top of it. So I can leave those points where they are and add a, um, a circle on top of it. So a space over here, I've taken each cluster, and the arrangement between clusters is right at the macro level, and internal you can see um, there's a high density internal to this one, a low density internal to that one, for example. Huh. So you can use these things in combination sometimes to gain some insights that you might not otherwise gain. And notice the fit on that one, 0.57, isn't that different than the fit over here, right? Huh. This is a network diagram you're going to see a lot out in the world. These are called chord diagrams, and so this tells you the flow, say, from whatever this edge is. You follow a little arc arrow out over to this side. Um, these are useless. Right? <laughs> these are pretty. They're nice. This is the pie chart of network diagrams. All right? You should never use a pie chart in general sort of science and communication. You should never use a chord diagram. Right. Um, uh, they look beautiful. They are cool looking. Right. I'll grant you they have this sort of nice, I don't know, look. <laughs> but, but somehow I don't know what to get out of them. Right. It just doesn't seem, doesn't seem that nice. Similarly, right. We've seen, we've all. This is getting back to Lisa's point from earlier. We've all seen these kinds of diagrams. Right. These are the. These are the. This is the Facebook diagrams of who's friends with who above on Facebook. And um, what this tells you is that people live in cities um, distributed around the world. Um, uh, and you know, more people live on the eastern seaboard than live in the Midwest, and no one lives in the middle of the Amazon who's on Facebook. Right? Um, uh, that's fine, right? but this is what it tells us. And I think that we, 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 it's beautiful. Again, this is a wonderful, beautiful, and if I'm selling Facebook, right? if I'm out as a marketer, I want this on the cover of time. Um, uh, but if I'm trying to actually do something scientific, it might be nice to know, in fact, that you know that parts of uh, South Africa are actually closer to uh, England than they are to other parts of Africa or something. And I can't tell that from this type of diagram. Or that China exists. Or that China exists, right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you have any, any sort of intuition about why these are so appealing? Is it... Because they're sparkly. They're sparkly. Yes. Yeah. No. I mean, in, in in this case, it, it's, it's literally that it's sparkly, right? I mean, it, you know, it's, it sort of looks like something that's bright and shiny, and so um, we're, we're our our primal urge is to be drawn to those things that are bright and shiny. Um, uh, so again, I think that it does depend on the question. This was a piece that we put. This is that same network where we really were trying to figure out 
the risk of one hospital to the other through the spread of patients. And so in that case, it was nice to be able to have the geographic spacing to it because it told us um, uh, essentially how, how hard it was to get from Dallas to Boston. Some such, but oftentimes, if you don't have a geographic um, uh, uh, question, then you um, might be better doing something else.